Our third and final lecture today will be presented by Professor Amy Hollywood. Amy Hollywood is the Elizabeth H. Monrad Professor of Christian Studies at Harvard Divinity School. Before coming to Harvard in 2005, she taught at Rhodes College, Dartmouth College, and the University of Chicago. Her monograph, The Soul is Virgin Wife, Mechthild of Magdeburg, Marguerite Poret, and Meister Eckhart, received the Otto Grundler Prize for Best Book in Medieval Studies from the International Congress of Medieval Studies. Another title, Sensible Ecstasy, Mysticism, Sexual Difference, and the Domains of History, was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2002. In her earlier writing, Professor Hollywood examined the influence of female contemplative communities on the thought of such figures as Meister Eckhart. Building on this scholarship, among Professor Hollywood's chief concerns has been the ecstatic experience of God among female mystics and what this suggests about embodiment, suffering, and the memorialization of loss. In her more recent work, she has drawn attention to the interest that French secular intellectuals have given to these women in their articulations of the mysteries of the flesh, effectivity, and sexual difference. So it is my honor to introduce to you Professor Hollywood, who will be presenting her paper, Thin Wings, on Reading, Death, and Devotion. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I know it's that point in the afternoon where everybody needs their cookie. Um, I mean, by everyone, I mean me. Uh, but oh, <laughs> so, I'm hoping I'll be able to keep, keep it lively. Um, first, again, thanks so much to the organizers, um, to Paul and Eric, and um, to Darlene Weaver, and the others who have done so much work to make this happen, um, for the invitation, for the opportunity to be here, for the opportunity to speak um, and exchange with you and with um, with, with Sean McMorial and William Desmond. I'm, I'm, I'm very honored and happy to be here. Um, in, in some ways, this paper, uh, if it's a paper, um, is, is an indirect response to some of the questions that were asked. Um, it comes in three parts, and I will mark those three parts. I do see it, I have the advantage in going last of having a couple mo moments where I can point to contact. I, I think that when um, Jean-Luc Morion writes about the Augustinian, uh, Augustinian conception of the truth as the will to love, um, I think that what I'm trying to point to here through medieval and contemporary poetic examples is the idea of reading as the practice of truth. Uh, and reading as the practice, perhaps, of love. Um, again, uh, with, with, with Professor Desmond, that sense of uh, the space between, the fullness of that space between, um, that is so full it is as if it, there is nothing there, I think is very much also at play in the variety of texts that I'll be some reading to you today, some talking to you about. Um, and I'm going to begin with two readings. I'm going to start with two visionary moments Two moments when truth, or perhaps it's mystery, appears to be unveiled. First, Hadevik, a Beguine. It is the middle of the 13th century in the Low Countries. A woman is at church, I didn't realize I'd be at church too, uh, seeing and hearing things. I was at Matins on the feast of the birth of the Blessed Mary, and after the third lesson, something wonderful was shown in the spirit, Gista. My heart had been moved beforehand by the words of love that were read there from the canticle, by which I was led to think of a perfect kiss. Shortly afterwards, in the second nocturne, I saw in the spirit a queen come in, clad in a gold dress, and her dress was all full of eyes, and all the eyes were completely transparent, like fiery flames, and nevertheless like crystal. And the crown she wore on her head had as many crowns, one above another, as there were eyes in her dress. You shall hear the number when she herself declares it. Before the queen walked three maids. The first maid wore a red cloak and carried two trumpets, the second a green cloak, and held two palm branches, each of which was sealed with a book, and the third a black cloak, and had the rights, and in her hand was something like a lantern full of days, by which her lady saw the profundity of the depths and the height of the highest ascent. Hadvik. The queen approached me dreadfully fast and set her foot on my throat and cried with a more terrible voice and said, do you know who I am? And I said, yes, indeed. Long enough have you caused me woe and pain. You are my soul's faculty of reason, Redna, and these are the officials of my household with whom you walk abroad in fine style. 
The trumpeter is holy fear, who has examined my perfection and all that belongs to the life of love. The second maiden is discernment, unterschiedlichkeit, discernment between you and love, and has tried to distinguish love's will, kingdom, and good pleasure from yours. The third maid is wisdom, this height, through whom I learned to know, the kinda, God alone as God, and all things as God, when in the spirit I am united with God. And it's the end of Hadwick. And then she's going to come back. Second, Joan Didion. Probably not where you thought I was going to go. Just going to guess. It's the early 20th, it's early 21st century. It's new, we're in New York City. A woman is in her apartment mourning her husband and daughter, seeing and hearing things. Stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone, prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone, silence the pianos and muffled drum, bring out the coffin, let the mourners come. Let airplanes circle mourning overhead, scribbling on the sky the message, he is dead. Put crepe bows round the white necks of the public doves, let the traffic policemen wear black cotton gloves. He was my north, my south, my east and west, my, morning, my working week and my Sunday rest, my noon, my midnight, my talk, my song, I thought that love would last forever. I was wrong. The stars are not wanted now. Put out every one. Pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. Pour away the ocean and sweep up the wood. For nothing now can ever come to any good. So go W.H. Auden's funeral blues, 16 lines that, during the days and weeks immediately after John's death, spoke directly to my anger, the unreasoning fury, the blind rage that I found myself feeling. I later showed Funeral Blues to Quintana. I told her that I was thinking of reading it at the memorial service she and I were planning for John. She implored me not to do so. She said she liked nothing about the poem. She said it was wrong. She was vehement on this point. At the time, I thought she was upset by the tone of the poem, its raw rhythms, the harshness with which it rejects the world, the sense it gives off of a speaker about to explode. I now think of her vehemence differently. I now think she saw Funeral Blues as dwelling on it. And this from the last two pages of Didion's book. The phrase need to know has been the problem all along. Only one person needs to know. She is, of course, the one person who needs to know. Let me just be in the ground. Let me just be in the ground and go to sleep. I imagine telling her. I'm able to imagine telling her because I still see her. Hello, mommies. The same way I still see her sitting on the bare floor crooning back to the ache track. Do you want to dance? I want to dance. The same way I still see the stephanotis in her braid, the same way I still see the plumeria tattoo through her veil, the same way I still see the bright red soles on her shoes as she kneels at the altar, the same way I still see her in the darkened upstairs cabin on the evening Pan Am from Honolulu to LAX, inventing the unforeseen uptick in Bunny Rabbit's fortunes. I know that I can no longer reach her. I know that, should I try to reach her, should I take her hand as if she were again sitting next to me in the upstairs cabin on the evening Pan Am from Honolulu to LAX? Should I lull her to sleep against my shoulder? Should I sing her the song about daddy gone to get the rabbit skin to wrap the baby bunny in? She will fade from my touch. Vanish. Pass into nothingness, the Keats line that frightened her. Fade as the blue nights fade. Go as the brightness goes. Go back into the blue. I, may, I myself placed her ashes in the wall. I myself saw the cathedral doors locked at six. I know what it is I am now experiencing. I know what the frailty is. I know what the fear is. The fear is not for what is lost. What is lost is already in the wall. What is lost is already behind the locked door. The fear is for what is still to be lost. You might see nothing still to be lost. Yet there is no day in her life on which I do not see her. Both of these women see and hear things. They feel things. Both women are, before they are visionaries, readers. Despite themselves, despite their rage and anger, Vahadvik rages too. Love is never enough for her. She is never enough for love. There is never enough love. Despite themselves, they are both devoted and devout readers. So my question, what does reading do to us? And more, how do we encounter that abyssal love that is Hadvik's God, that is the unpassable space between Joan Didion and her daughter, Quintana Rudan? How do we encounter the chasm in, in reading, by reading, through reading? 
What does it mean to read in the 13th century, the 21st, the 4th, or the 12th? What is the difference between hearing God and hearing your daughter, or hearing nothing? Does anyone ever really hear nothing? I don't want to say that we all read the same way across all of those centuries, or that we all have the same visions, or even the same understanding of what vision is. But I do want to suggest that understanding something about how Havoc might have read may help us understand something about the way we read now. What we, of course, is always the question. Reading in the Christian tradition is first and foremost and always prayer. Thinking about how monks and nuns read, thinking about how semi-religious women like Havoc read, I want to argue, can help us understand something about the way Didion, like many of us, turned to books. So the second part. This is my more historian hat on. In the Benedictine life, which was the hallmark of Christian perfection for centuries, private reading and devotion go hand in hand. Almost anything you can say about prayer, you can say about reading, and almost anything you can say about reading, you can say about prayer. So I'm going to Sometimes you might be confused about which I'm talking about. They, it, it both go so closely together that, 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 that you can take them as almost, un, almost fully assimilable in terms of the theories of what happens when you read, what happens when you pray. Benedict of Nursia, who's author of the rule that was central to the Western Christian monastic tradition, follows John Cashin, who died in about 435, contemporary of Augustine's. Uh, uh, I probably shouldn't be talking about Cashin in this Augustinian world, um, but <laughs> I'm not talking about the bad Cashin. I'm not thinking about free will here. Okay. Um, so anyway, so Cashin and a host of other early monastic writers, um, and Benedict follows Cashin and a host of other early monastic writers in arguing that the monk and the nun, about whom they cared, although they weren't directly speaking to nuns, uh, either Benedict or Cashin, seeks to attain a state of unceasing prayer. Benedict cites Vulgate's Psalm 118, seven times a day have I praised you, and at midnight I arose to give you praise. He calls on his monks to come together eight times a day for the communal recitation, chanting, or singing of the psalms and other prayers and readings. This is the work of God, the Opus Dei, enjoined by the rule. Each of the psalms was recited once a week, with many repeated once or more a day. Benedict provides a detailed schedule for his monks, one in which the biblical injunction to always have a prayer on one's lips is enacted through the division of the day into the eight canonical hours, vigils, louds, prime, turfs, sex, non, vespers, and compline. I'm convinced if I make myself say that over and over again, I will remember them. It has yet to occur. Okay. Um, for Benedict, as for Cashin, on whose work he liberally drew, the intensity and the authenticity of one's feeling for God is enabled through communal ritualized prayer, as well as through private reading and devotion, as well as reading out loud. The monks were always being read to. Nuns in the comments were always being read to, even as they did other kind of work. Proper performance of God's work in prayer requires that the monk not, not simply recite the psalms, Instead, he was called on to feel what the psalmist felt, to learn to fear and desire and love God in and through the words of the psalms. According to Cashin, we know God, love God, and experience God when our experience and that of the psalmist come together. This is Cashin. For divine scripture is clearer, and its inmost organs, so to speak, are revealed to us when our experience, experientiae, not only perceives but even anticipates its thought, and the meaning of the words are disclosed to us not by exegesis, but by proof. What's going on there? When we have the same disposition, affectum, in our heart with which each psalm was sung or written down, then we shall become like its author, grasping the significance beforehand rather than afterward. That is, we first take in the power of what is said rather than the knowledge of it, recalling what has taken place or what does take place in us in our daily life when we reflect upon the scriptural text. So when the monk and nun can anticipate what words will follow in a psalm, not because they have memorized them, but because their hearts are so at one with the psalmist that these words spontaneously come to their lips, then he or she knows and experiences God. The word translated here as disposition is derived from the Latin affectus, from the verb afficio, to do something to someone, to exert an influence on another body or another person, to bring another into a particular state of mind. In many ways, I see Cashin as an early Christian theorizer and philosophizer of many of the things that we were hearing earlier from, from Jean-Luc and from, and from William. Um, at the center of ancient and medieval usages is the notion that love is brought into being in one person by the actions of another. It always comes to us from the outside. 
For Cashin, as for later generations of monastic authors, our love for God is always engendered by God's love for us. God acts, apikio. Humans are the recipients of God's actions. So, affectus, the noun, is derived from the passive participle of afikio, to have had something done to you. The acquisition of proper dispositions through habit, and habitus is a key word for cashin, is the operation of the freely given grace that is God's love itself. There's no distinction here between mediation through the words of scripture and immediacy, that of God's presence, between habit and spontaneity, between the impersonal and the personal, or between feeling and knowledge. And I think that's the hardest thing for modern audiences to grasp, that spontaneity and habitus are not antithetical to each other, that through the habitus we come to feel things spontaneously. The affects, moods, or dispositions engendered by God are not only those of love and desire, Fear, dread, shame, and sorrow, gratitude, joy, triumph, and ecstasy are all expressed in the Psalms and in the other songs found within scripture. In fact, as Abba Isaac explains to Cashin and German as his buddy in the conferences, one single verse of the Psalms can contain all of the feelings contained across the Psalms. Psalm 70, verse one, O God, incline unto my aid. O Lord, make haste to help me. According to Cashin and other early Christian interpreters, the Psalms lay out, and the reason the Psalms are so important, was because the Psalms lay out the full realm of human emotion. They didn't use the word emotion, feeling, affectus. And by coming to know God in and through these affects, the monk comes to know both himself and the divine. So we, when we want to understand our own experience, we're feeling something and we don't know how to articulate what we're feeling, you go to the Psalms, and in the Psalms you will find the expression of sorrow, the expression of grief, compunction, of joy, and you'll learn to understand what it is that you yourself are feeling. We find all these dispositions, Cashin writes. My quirk is exceedingly dry, I have to say. I don't know it's from, regardless of where one's from, I'm always having to drink while I talk. We find all these dispositions expressed in the Psalms so that we may see whatever occurs as in a very clear mirror. We see what's occurring to us in this clear mirror that is scripture and, it, and recognize it more effectively. Having been instructed in this way, with our dispositions, our affects for our teachers, we shall grasp this as something seen rather than heard. We grasp the scripture as something seen rather than heard. And from the inner disposition of the heart, we shall bring forth not what has been committed to memory, but what is inborn in the very nature of things. Thus, we shall penetrate its meaning not through the written text, but with experience leading the way. Here, what begins as a physical, affective, and cognitive experience leads to an inner transformation that Cashin calls fiery prayer. The monk passes beyond the body and lets forth in his spirit unutterable groans and sighs. He feels an unspeakable ecstasy of heart and an insatiable gladness of spirit. Those are all Cashin's phrases. Prayer moves beyond images and affect, even as it is their apotheosis. For Cashin, the entire body and soul of the monk is affected. He is transformed by the words of the Psalms so that he lives them, and through this experience he comes to know, with heart and body and mind, that God is great and good. For cash and Christians attain the height of prayer when, quote, every love, every desire, every effort, every undertaking, every thought of ours, everything that we live, that we speak, that we breathe, will be God. And when that unity with the, which the Father now has with the Son, and which the Son has with the Father, will be carried over into our understanding and our mind. So that just as he loves us with a sincere and pure and indissoluble love, we too may be joined to him with a perpetual and inseparable love. And so united with him that whatever we breathe, whatever we understand, whatever we speak may be God. Although the fullness of fruition in God will never occur in this life, according to Cashin, the monk and the nun, they train themselves daily through obedience, chastity, poverty, and most importantly, reading and prayer to attain it. Cashin's understanding of the role of the Psalms in the monastic life lays the foundation for monastic thought and practice throughout the Middle Ages. The liturgies become more complex. There's houses that do the whole Psalter once a day, you know, I mean, there, it, various complexities are added to it, but the basic pattern, the basic conception of the prayer life uh, is, is central to throughout the West in the, in the, in the Middle Ages and, and, and beyond. At the heart of Benedictine communal life, Cashin's understanding of prayer is also vital to the patterns of reading and private devotion described by the Bull of Benedict. Reading, whether allowed in a communal setting or privately, is, as I said earlier, ubiquitous in the life of the monk and the nun. And the rule is clear not only about its important, but importance, but also about what ought to be read. This is the very final words of the, of the rule. And they're interesting both in their profundity and their mundanity simultaneous, simultaneously. 
For anyone hastening on to the perfection of monastic life, the rule explains, there are the teachings of the Holy Fathers, the observance of which will lead him to the very heights of perfection. What page, what passage of the inspired books of the Old and New Testaments is not the truest guide for human life? What book of the Holy Catholic Fathers does not resoundingly summon us along the true way to reach the Creator? Then, besides the conferences of the Fathers, their institutes, and their laws, there's also the rule of our Holy Father Basil. For observant and obedient monks, all these are nothing less than tools for the cultivation of virtue. But as for us, they make us blush, blush for shame at being so slothful, so unobservant, so negligent. Are you hastening toward your heavenly home? Then with Christ's help, keep this little rule that we have written for beginners. After that, you can set out for the loftier summits of the teachings and virtues we mentioned above. And under God's protection, you will reach them. Amen. The rule as a whole is a prayer. In these, the closing lines of the rule, Benedict enjoins his monks to read and to study the rule itself, but also the Bible and the writings of the Holy Catholic Fathers, most prominently among them, Passion, author of the Conferences and the Institutes, two of the only books named by Benedict in the rule of Benedict as things to be read within his convent. At the heart of the monastic life, then, lies the transformation of the monk's or nun's experience through his or her engagement with the psalms and other texts performed, read, chanted, or sung during the divine office. This transformation goes hand in hand with that engendered through the reading of scripture and other religious texts, Lectio Divina, in Rule of Benedict 48. Bless you. Um, during Benedict's time, and with increasing complexity in the years to follow, the divine office involved not simply the psalms, but also other biblical texts and non-scriptural hymns and readings. The interweaving of biblical and non-biblical sources, the particular order in which texts are organized, and the shifting temporality of song, for much of the liturgy was sung in the, in the high uh, and, and uh, late Middle Ages, render the liturgy, in the words of the musicologist Susan Boynton, a mode of performative exegesis. Multiple interpretations of scripture are, Boynton argues, literally performed through the juxtaposition, entwining, and expansion of scriptural texts in the liturgy. Another musicologist, Margot Fossler, gives a fascinating glimpse of this process in her studies of Hildegard of Bingen, uh, who lived from 1098 to 1179, um, who was a visionary and also wrote music and musical compositions. She wrote both words, poems, and also the music itself. As a Benedictine nun, Fossler notes, Hildegard would have heard the psalms sung and verses, she would have heard psalms and verses from individual psalms in a number of different contexts and settings. Again, each psalm was sung in its complete form at least once a week in the divine office. These renditions were framed by antiphons, a fancy word for responses, as those of us raised in this tradition uh, know, the Catholic tradition. Um, sometimes verses from the psalm in question, sometimes newly written text created to, give, to link a given psalm with a particular hour of the day, or a feast day, or a season, and sometimes an alleluia, a term from the psalms, the singing of which might be short, shorter, extended, simple, or complex, and did a lot of different words, a lot of different work musicologically um, throughout the, the medieval liturgy and beyond again. The antiphon, Fassler argues, comments upon the psalm text, transforming its meaning in the process. A particular theological view of the role of Mary in creation and salvation, for example, is performed through the juxtaposition of psalms with antiphons. This becomes clear when we look to the antiphons Hildegard wrote, Hildegard wrote for a feast of the Virgin Mary. We don't know which feast precisely. Um, as they stand in relationship to the rule of Benedict's prescriptions for the Psalms to be said at louds on Sundays and important feast days. And Fausto has this essay that's wonderful where she does, she lays out the Vulgate of all the Psalms uh, with, with the antiphons so you can actually visually see how, how it would have lay, been laid out for that particular uh, morning, um, uh, morning recitation. As Fassler notes, the opening song for Lauds, Psalm 66, was performed without antiphony. So you started with Psalm 66. And then after that, there was an antiphon written by Hildegard for the Marian feast, which stands in productive counterpart to Psalm 92, the second psalm to be recited or sung during the hour of Lauds on feast days. So Hildegard has her nuns sing, today a closed gate is open to us, that which the serpent choked in a woman. So the flower from the Virgin Mary gleams in the dawn. That's, that's the Hildegard's antiphon. Reference to the dawn immediately situates the antiphon in the hour of lauds, which is the first of the day, meant to be performed as the sun rises. The centrality of Mary, moreover, provides a very specific reading of the generally Christologically interpreted 92, Psalm 92 that follows. All the psalms were read Christologically. 
Um, and all the psalms were often understood as spoken by Christ himself. So if you're speaking with the psalmist, you're speaking, with, you're, you're, you're speaking as and with Christ. Um, Hildegard takes this and puts a, a particular Marian spin on it. So the first verse of Psalm 92, the Lord hath reigned, he is clothed in beauty. The Lord is clothed with strength and hath girded himself. The psalm certainly would have been heard as referring to Christ, but Mary and her role in the incarnation, Mary as the source of that fleshly clothing in which Christ comes, is highlighted. The throne prepared from of old, Psalm 92.2, is the Virgin Mary as the throne of wisdom, a common theme in late antique Christianity and in the 12th century. And you see images of this, right? Mary with her, her, her lap, really almost like a chair, and, and Christ in majesty upon, upon her lap. When the nuns sing, wonderful are the surges of the sea, from Psalm 92, verse 4, against the background of Hildegard's antiphon, Mary as the star of the sea is evoked. Finally, Fossler argues, the final verse of Psalm 92 includes the words, holiness becomes thy house. And this would too, uh, excuse me, let me read that again. Thus, uh, the final verse of Psalm 92 includes the words, holiness becomes thy house. And this too would resonate with the Marian interpretation of the Psalm text, Mary being the most common Christian type for the church, the house of the Lord. So against the claim, commonly made by modern scholars, that medieval women were unable to engage in the interpretation of scripture because they were denied access to the priesthood and to the schools, Fassler demonstrates how Hildegard's musical compositions and the antiphons she created for the divine office are an exegetically driven and musically performed theology. She's reading, she's interpreting, she's theologizing through these, these songs. The complex relationship between song, experience, and book is further articulated by the Cistercian Bernard of Clairvaux, who died about 1153, is a contemporary of Hildegard's, um, in his sermons on the Song of Songs. In explaining the name of the book, Bernard enumerates the scriptural songs so vital to monastic experience, not only the Psalms, but also the songs of Deborah in Judges 5.1, Judith, Samuel's mother, the authors of Lamentations and Job, and all the other songs found throughout the biblical text. If you experience your own experience, experientium, Bernard writes, surely it is in the victory by which your faith overcomes the world, and in your leaving the lake of wretchedness and the filth of the marsh, that you sing to the Lord himself a new song, because he has done marvelous works. If you are a monk, or a nun, or a Protestant, you might hear what monks and nuns and Protestants hear in those lines. I can't say I do. But as the modern annotations show, annotations that would be unnecessary for a monastic audience, Bernard's text is a palimpsest of scriptural references. Surely it is in the victory by which your faith overcomes the world, 1 John 5, 4, and in your leaving the lake of wretchedness and the filth of the marsh, Psalm 39, 3, that you sing to the Lord himself a new song because he has done marvelous works. This one I think many of us will recognize. Uh, Psalm 97, verse 1. Bernard's heart, has, his mind and his heart is so thoroughly imbued with the Bible through his monastic practice, that he needs no other language, or very little other language, with which to describe the soul's experience of God. Following a tradition of interpretation of the Song of Songs that begins at least with origin, Bernard argues that its title shows it to be the preeminent of songs, the song through which one attains to the highest knowledge of God. This sort of song, Bernard explains, only the touch of the Holy Spirit teaches, 1 John 2, and it is learned by experience alone. In the third sermon of the series, he calls on his listeners and readers to read the Book of Experience as they interpret the Song of Songs. Quote, today we read the Book of Experience, Libro Experientiae. That's not biblical, that's what's interesting. Where, where did this come from? Let us turn to ourselves and let each of us search his own consciousness about what is said. I want to investigate whether it has been given to any of you to say, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. Song of Songs 1-1. Bernard claims that it is through attention to the book of experience that the monk determines what he has of God and what he lacks of God. Bernard calls on his fellow monks to see the gap between their experience of God's love and their love for God, and then to meditate on, chew over, and digest the words of the song so that they might become more fully able to inhabit them. The soul should strive, Bernard insists, to be able to sing with the bride of the song, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. So the very practice Cashin demands in his monks' engagements with the Psalms here serves as a basis for the higher, the deeper uh, movement into the divine enabled by the Song of Songs. 
Bernard stresses that the song is not for beginners, but for the advanced. That is, for those who have already come to experience the fear, contrition, gratitude, and love voiced in the Psalms. When Bernard asks his readers and listeners to, quote, hear the demand of one who has experienced the kiss of Christ's mouth that is the Song of Songs, he again cites a psalm. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Psalm 50, verse 14. And these are all, um, well, that, actually, I don't think that is the Vulgate. I think that's the modern. Um, for himself, Bernard writes, quote, a soul like mine, burdened with sins, cannot dare to say that, while it's still subject to fleshly passions, 2 Timothy. And while it does not feel the sweetness of the spirit and is almost wholly unfamiliar with and inexperienced in inner joys. Although few, Bernard claims, can speak the words of the song wholeheartedly, his sermons are an attempt to agenda in himself and in his readers, and the, and, the, and, the, and the sermons were most certainly meant to be read, just this wholeheartedness. Only in this way can the soul ever hope to experience the kiss and hence to speak with the bride and her experience of union with the bridegroom. For Bernard, such a kiss is only ever fleeting in this life. Claims to more extended experiences of the divine presence and of the marking of that presence on the mind and body of the believer. In visions, verbal outcries, trances, convulsions, ecstasies, raptures, and other extraordinary experiences will shortly follow. They're actually happening at the same time as Bernard's writing. Um, and they'll be particularly important in text by and about women. They will spread, moreover, after Bernard, outside of the monastery and convent, into the world of the new religious movements, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, other smaller orders, uh, the semi-religious, like the Beguines, and to the laity. Yet the experience will remain tied, and this is the crucial part of my argument, to reading and to prayer, to scripture, to liturgy, to prayer, to the book. It will continue to be an experience of transformation in and through song and the book. We can see this if we go back to Hildegard. Hildegard appeared to have just spontaneously have a vision, right? That's the way people tend to read Hildegard's vision. She was sitting around one day, and then this lady full of eyeballs came. Um, okay, it was a slightly truncated version of the, of the, of the, of, of the actual vision, but you, you get my point. All right, um, and what people, ha what, what a number of scholars have been doing is, 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 is trying to trace out, no, wait a minute, she tells us, she gives us the liturgical context in which this occurs. So what does that mean? Uh, and I'm going to trace out one of these arguments briefly um, uh, uh, to end this section of the paper. Um, Werner Freites has demonstrated precisely this, this interpenetration between uh, vision, reading, liturgy, uh, in her analysis of Hadwick's Book of Visions. Um, the, I, I read from Vision 9, that's what I'll return to, but it's a book of, of uh, 11 visions um, that clearly meant to be read together um, and were clearly meant to be read. Um, Fritters insists that, quote, medieval religious visions are not naive renderings of spontaneous experiences. Yes, it's kind of sad we still have to argue it, but we do. Rather, like most 13th century ecstatic visionaries, Hadwick experienced her, her raptures within the sacred space of the church and within the words and rituals of the liturgy in which she participated with intense personal devotion. Fritters goes on to show that Hadwick's Vision 9 is deeply indebted to the specific liturgical context in which it occurs. Now remember, from the beginning, Hadwick tells us that she had the vision during Matins on the Feast of the Nativity of Mary, during which she was moved by the words from the Song of Songs, the Canticles is how she puts it. Um, Psalm of, Song of Songs verses 1 to 10 were her, are the third reading uh, for, the, um, for uh, Matins on the Feast of the Nativity of Mary. Okay, so we know what she was hearing. And then I'm going to read again from Hadwick. You heard this already, but just a reminder. Shortly afterwards, in the second nocturne, I saw in the spirit a queen come in clad in a gold dress, and her dress was all full of eyes, and all the eyes were completely transparent, like fiery flames, and nevertheless like crystal. And the crown she wore on her head had as many crowns, one above another, as there were eyes in her dress. You shall hear the number when she herself declares it, before the queen walked three maids. As, as Freitas shows, the general content of this vision comes from Psalm 44, which was sung in the second nocturne of the Feast of the Nativity of Mary. The psalm, in its Vulgate rendering, describes a queen in gilded clothing following by virgins. Freitas suggests the dress all full of eyes might be barred from Hildegard of Bingen, whose Shivias, one of her big visionary books, contains a famous image of a woman covered with eyes. Um, and the, and the, and the Shivyas was distributed um, not only with the text, but also with, with a, a visual program that had been designed by Hildegard to show people what she had seen. So there were visual representations of this. Hildegard, we can't know if Hadwick knew Hildegard's book, but we know she knew about Hildegard because Hadwick wrote a list of the perfect um, on which she included herself. Um, and she also included Hildegard, who saw all those visions 
on her list of the perfect. So we know that she knows about Hildegard, and she might have known about her, the visionary work. Freitas goes on to provide a detailed analysis of Hadwick's imagery in the vision, pointing to its sources in the Book of Revelation. The queen, of, the queen is reason. Freitas wants to translate it um, wisdom, but it doesn't work. Um, so I, I'm going to sweet reason. And reason is associated with Christ, particularly in his apocalyptic role. The eyes, fire, and crystal all appear together in Revelations 4, 4 to 6. The description of the court of the heavenly Jerusalem. Fiery eyes and multitudes of crowns appear in Revelation 19, where Christ is described coming in glory on a white horse. So we can see that in Revelation, all the elements of the vision are in place. Um, she just leaves out the white horse, as far as I can figure out. The interplay of images, like the interplay of text in Hildegard of Bingen's liturgical writing and Bernard of Clairvaux's sermons and commentaries, are exegetical, theological, and experiential. For Hadwick, I doubt, I very much doubt, that it would have made any sense to separate the three terms. As Freders argues, Hadwick's book of visions is an alternative form of experiential scriptural exegesis, We're finding this language repeating itself. Hadwick describes, in Freders' words, an affective meditation during the reading of the opening lines of Psalm 44 that brings her into rapture. In the course of that rapture, the hidden sense of the scriptural text is revealed to her in a visual way. The various elements comprising the visionary images and phrases point to texts and ideas that were triggered in Hadwick's memory and that were in one way or another connected in her mind to that liturgical text. So she seemed to have had an intensely visual imagination when she heard or read certain texts. She, she, saw, she saw things. The written report of her ecstatic experience can then function for Hadwick's devotees as an exegetical initiation into God's truth. By meditating on the vision, the reader could, like Hadwick during the primary visionary experience, become aware of the fact that the wisdom of God, again, I'm not sure she's talking about wisdom, but all right, resided inside their very own souls, and that it was their task to let it dwell there as queen, unhindered. Uh, I have to change this section because I have found that I totally disagree with writers about how she reads the vision. The important point is what she reads it, how she reads it as an event. So Hadwick not only reaches not, Hadwick writes this, in writing the vision, not only teaches her reader something about the nature of the soul, that the divine resides and has always resided within it, and that is in the vision, but also provides a script for the performance and the experience of that joyful knowledge. She provides a text for others to read and for others to come to experience something of the joy she experienced in the vision she describes. This knowledge, moreover, depends on an unsaying, an apophasis, a letting go of that very reason to whom Hadwick speaks in the vision. This is where Freitas and I disagree. The final lines of the vision say, then reason became subject to me, and I left her. But love came and embraced me, and I came out of the spirit and remained lying until late in the day, inebriated with unspeakable wonders. Like Cashin's monks who move between the prayerful meditation on and recitation of the Psalms to a fiery prayer in which all words and images are burnt away, Hadwick points to multiple ways in which the divine can be encountered. She offers her visions and her songs, she wrote songs, um, to be read and sung in community. For through their naming and unnaming of God and of the soul, these texts promise to transform the lives of her readers into that joyful, loving divinity that is always already there, unknowing and unknown within them. She writes so that others can become readers, just as she is a reader of the scriptural text on the basis of which she writes. Okay. All right, how are we for time? Am I okay? Okay, because I've got a last, so, so part three. I always feel like that takes forever, so okay. All right, so, so what I'm gonna do now is the part, part three, and these are to reflect upon uh, together. Uh, a reading, my reading of, 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 a, of, a, of a very brief reading, or not brief, I mean, too brief, but also whatever. It's not that brief, don't get excited, you're not, you can't go yet. But on the other hand, it's brief in relationship to what the poems deserve. Um, of a, book by, a book of poems by Susan Howe called That This, which appeared in, um, in uh, 2011, I think. And you have a page from it, um, uh, I think, that is going around that I'll come to in a minute. Um, and when I, when I approached uh, writing about um, Susan Howe's work, um, a work that I've loved for a really long time, um, uh, I approached it with this question of reading. And I had been thinking about Cashin, I'd been thinking about Hadwick, I'd been thinking about precisely this material. And so I thought it would be interesting to put it into conversation, uh, at least through juxtaposition. I haven't spelt out all the links yet um, with those readings um, now. So what does it mean to read? 
could arguably be the central question of Susan Howe's That This. What does it mean to read devout, devotely, devotedly, mystically? Reading Susan Howe repeatedly raises this question for me. The opening lines to Frolic Architecture, which is the second sequence of That This, embeds the book in the history of reading. It says Howe, that this book is a history of, a shadow that is a shadow of, me mystically one and another, another another to subserve. Frolic architecture is a collage. Texts in different typefaces and font sizes are scattered here, bunched together there, often with words cut off against the white of the paper or obscured by those of other texts that seem to overlay them on the flat page. Phrases appear upside down, sideways, partially cut off from top to bottom as well as from the sides. You can see this if you just look at the page I gave you. Many of the words are from Hannah Edwards' Wetmore's Diary, which is housed in the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University as part of a vast collection of Edwards' family papers. Hannah Edwards Wetmore, um, 1713 to 1773, was the younger sister of the, of the um, uh, Christian uh, uh, evangelizer and, and theologian Jonathan Edwards, 1703 to 1758. I'm not sure where all of the texts come from, and I find myself torn between perhaps the scholar's desire to track down the sources and the desire, I don't know what to call it, uh, to let them sit unattested to, side by side, overlapping, cut up on house pages. The another another in which the book and the me are mystically embedded, which they subserve, seems to me to be Jonathan Edwards' other, his sister, Hannah, but also his wife, Sarah Pierpont Edwards, with whom Howe is also obsessed. More obvious still is Susan Howe's other, her husband, the philosopher, Peter Hare, who died in 2008, to whose memory the book is dedicated. His death and her life in the wake of that death are the subject of the first part of the book, The Disappearance Approach. <coughs> in the opening paragraph, Howe describes the morning she found her husband dead in his bed. I knew when I saw him with the CPAP mask over his mouth and nose and heard the whooshing sound of air blowing that he wasn't asleep. No. Starting from nothing with nothing when everything else has been said hangs, a, a single line without punctuation, at the end of that first section, a freestanding paragraph without a close. Howe then turns to Sarah Edwards. This is Howe quoting Edwards, and I'll continue with Howe. Oh, my very dear child, what, what shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. On April 3rd, 1758, Sarah Edwards wrote this in a letter to her daughter, Esther Edwards Burr, when she heard of Jonathan's sudden death in Princeton. For Sarah, all works of God are a kind of language or voice to instruct us in things pertaining to calling and confusion. I love to read her husband's analogies, metaphors, and similes. For Jonathan and Sarah, all rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. So in general, there's always progress, as in the revolution of a wheel, and each soul comes upon the call of God in his word. I read words, but I don't hear God in them. For Jonathan and Sarah uh, Pierpont Edwards to read scripture and nature, to read God's word, which is in everything, is to hear the persistently calling voice of God. Howe reads the Edwardses, she reads the Bible, she reads history, but they come to her not from God, but, quote, from nothing with nothing, end quote. I hear words, but I don't hear God in them. What does it mean to read devoutly, religiously, mystically, without hearing God? The disjunction seems complete. Yet Howe continues to be obsessed by Sarah Edwards' words by the form of her lamentation for her dead husband. Oh, that we may kiss the rod and lay our hands on our mouths. The Lord has done it. He has made me adore his goodness that we had him so long. But my God lives and he has my heart. We are all given to God and there I am and love to be. I admire the way thought contradicts feeling in Sarah's furiously calm letter. We can't be just limited. We can't be limited to just this anxious life." End quote. Howe's work lies on the cusp of this impossibility, and the impossibility that there be some way in which those we love return to us out of the nothingness to ease this anxious life. Maybe there is some, and this is how, maybe there is some not yet understood return to people we have loved and lost. I need to imagine the possibility even if I don't believe it. End quote. Whatever possibility there is lies for how in books, manuscripts, diaries, graphs, texts, and in touch. And not only in texts. Frolic architecture includes photograms by James Welling. How describes paintings, Poussin, and scraps of cloth, shoes, mylar wrappers, an old cashmere jacket, the debris of a life. 
She writes of the past pressing heavily on the present that she often feels when alone with books and papers. And immediately following these lines, she writes, I've been reading some of W.H. Auden's The Sea in the Mirror, one beautiful sentence about the way we all reach and reach but never touch. A skinny covering overspreads our bones, and our arms are thin wings. Reading is a form of touch, but even more the tactility, the page touches us in a way that supersedes, perhaps, the power of words and of names. How wants us not only to see, but to touch the page, or to imagine its feel? This is a quote. The folio-sized double leaves Jonathan, Sarah, and his ten tall sisters wrote on were often homemade, hand-stitched from linen rags salvaged by women from worn-out clothing. Grassroots out, of grassroots out of tune steps and branches, quotations of psalms, dissonant scriptural clusters oppressed between coarse cardboard covers with frayed edges. The rag paper color has grown deeper and richer in some. One in particular with a jacket he constructed from old newspapers, then tied together at the center with a string, looks like a paper model for a canoe. The minister, or possibly some later scholar, has christened his antique paper vessel the doctrine of the justice and grace of God explained and defended, and the contrary errors that have of late prevailed. Confuted. I feel called to a pilgrimage, wanting nothing more at this moment than to go to New Haven to hold this book, these folio leaves, in my hand. They are real, present in another place, another another to which I can subserve myself, unlike the cinders of happy chatter that how her husband, son, and new daughter-in-law shared on the day of her husband's death. Yet books, like our lives, are, in the words of Hannah Edwards, exceedingly brittle and uncertain. Howe repeats these words at least twice in the book, first in the prose poem dealing with her husband's death and again in frolic architecture. There, in different typescripts held together with the invisible scotch tape that Howe used when composing the sequence, an invisible scotch tape that left traces on the paper when it was run through a Canon copier, Howe brings together texts, only some of which I can identify, and this is what's on the right hand of, your, of, of, the, of the handout. Effect silk codes would have on agents in the field. He answered that, or what shall I say to you? For it to me that I was so separate, Tej, our lives are all exceedingly brittle, could hide behind the silk, in common with remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife looks back and is turned into a pillar of salt. Orpheus looks back and loses Eurydice a second time. Howe describes the night before her husband's death. He followed more slowly. I wondered why, but it was so cold that I didn't bother to look back. I can't, I can't resolve the dilemmas, or even begin to show the way Howe wrestles with them, violently taking the kingdom, some new, unborn, unknown kingdom, by storm, the unrepresentable violence of a negative double. Returning home, Howe writes, after only a day or two away, I often have the sense of intruding on infinite and finite local evocations and wonder how things are in relation to how they appear. This sixth sense of another reality, even in simplest objects, is what poets set out to show but cannot, but cannot once and for all. If there is an afterlife, then we still might. If not, not. There is the afterlife of the book, the manuscript, of language, and the sewn threads of women's work. There are the barely legible pages scattered through frolic architecture and the elliptical beauty of the poems that make up the third section of the book, that this. There's that and there's this. Day is a type when visible. Objects change then put on form, but the antitype, that thing not shadowed. How asks, Hannah Edwards Wetmore asks, they ask together, where shall I find real? To which an answer seems to come pages later but I attempted to read. Might to read, mystically to be, might to read mystically be to read in and between type and antitype, to allow what can be seen, heard, smelt, tasted, and touched to show forth, but also to leave open the space for life's other, that thing not shadowed, that death seen yet unforeseen, teetering on the edge of legibility, the illegible legibility of Howe's mystic page, fragmented, fractured, fiercely figurative. Howe's book, this, that, like a gloss psalter or a well-worn devotional book, from the pages of which someone or something mutely speaks. Hannah has taken off her embroidered shoes. She is dipping her bare feet in varieties of light. And so much more. Thin wings take flight. Is truth in these fragments, these mangled words, this blank page? Thank you.
Um, I, I, I feel like there was two diff maybe two different things in there. One was about about um, passion is involving steps. Right. Right. Um, Reading as a sort of repetition that either numbs the senses or numbs the soul or vice versa. That's yeah. That's a symbol. A symbol is, is, is passion. A symbol is a symbol for like passion. I, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that for 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 passion and for what I kind of want to do with him and help have him help me think about. I'm not sure that that. That distinction holds. Um, I think that um, y you're certainly not, you know, according to passion on prayer. Um, you and, and in this, he differs somewhat from Evagrius, even though he's so dependent on Evagrius. Um, th that for passion and prayer, you're not numbing. You're not. You're not numbing. You're not. You're not quieting. You're not sort of evacuating a space. Um, remember, for Evagrius, the end point of prayer is, is a silent prayer. Right? It's an imageless prayer. It's like it is a kind of evacuation. For 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 passion, it's not. It's fiery prayer, um, and it's and it's spoken of using the language of 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 of, of frankly of, of erotic of, of erotic ecstasy. Um, and so and so the the question of what what one is doing effectively through the process of, of reading and reading now writ large, you know, reading in terms of any kind of recitation, engagement with textuality or, 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 or a symbolic system, um, is itself a way of coming to know ourselves in the, in the multiplicity of our affective, in the, in the, in the multifariousness of our active, affective life, in order to then direct all of that sort of affective charge towards God, towards love of God, and when we become love, if we can become fully love, we become fully God, right? Um, and and the pretty strong claims are made. Passion, not so much, but in later traditions, pretty strong claims are made about the fact that if it, you know that God's love for us is what turns us to God. God's lo God's love is what God is. If we turn to God fully in love and become the mirror, right, of God's love, then we are in some, we are in some a, some deep way God in that moment. Um, and kind of some kind of deification is how the Eastern traditional talk about it occurs. Um, so, so in that moment, I don't think I think you can talk about the sort of converging of a variety of affects in 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 love as the ultimate um, uh, a site, um, and that occurs through a kind of painstaking practice of that includes suffering, pain, guilt, contrition, all the things that you also learn through through the Psalter and through the other books of Scripture. Um, but but the but the but the end point is not to become it, it, the end point for passion is not apatheia. It's not it's not it's not passionlessness um, as it is for some in the Greek tradition. Um, it's really to convert all passion to love, uh, and in that sense, it seems to me um, that and and that seems to me to be at the heart of what people refer to. I think mistake. I think problematically is the sort of bridal or passion mysticism of the high and late Middle Ages. I hope that helps. Okay, yes. Where are we, Thomas? Okay.